we're going to look at the period of oscillation of our oscillator. We've already talked a bit about the period of oscillation, specifically in the case where theta dot was a constant, and the period was straightforward to calculate. Now let's look at a slightly different example. Theta dot equals r minus cosine theta. Now this is an example where oscillation is going to be turned off for some values of r, but on for other values of r. And I'd actually specifically like us to think about the period of oscillation when we're relatively close to the bifurcation where oscillation is going to turn off. So here we are at some value of r where oscillation is turned on and theta is always increasing. I could sort of draw what that looks like versus time. I'm slow at some values of theta and faster at other. This is ex exaggerated and maybe not really the right shape, but conveying the sense that I move slowly um, when theta is near zero and fast uh, when theta is near pi. And so I'm moving fast when theta is down here at negative pi, more slowly near zero, and fast again up at pi. And I'm just thinking of theta mod 2 pi as I draw this in. So over and over again, theta is going to be following those curves. Thinking about the period of oscillation, I specifically want to ask the question, how does the period of oscillation change as we get close to the bifurcation? Since we know that once we're at the bifurcation, there's not going to be any oscillation. So the question we're going to ask is what happens to the period of oscillation as r goes down towards 1, since 1 is where the oscillation turns off. Specifically, uh, when we exactly hit 1 and the bifurcation happens, uh, no matter what value of theta we start at, we're going to approach 0. There's going to be the development of this half-stable fixed point, and so there's not going to be any oscillation. But when r is slightly greater than 1, we're going to move quickly over here, and we're going to move slowly over here. It's almost as though when r is a little bit above the bifurcation, there's a slowness that is kind of a remnant of the bifurcation. And you could imagine that the closer we are to the bifurcation, the slower that's going to go, and the further we are, the faster we're going to move through this zone. And so that's something that we're going to try to quantify. So this leads to the question, can we use the period of the oscillator as a sign of how close we are to the bifurcation? How do we calculate the period of the oscillator? Well, we're going to jump into that calculation and we're going to see where the distance to the bifurcation comes into it. Now, the amount of time that it takes to go around the circle is just the integral of dt from my start time to my end time. The problem is I don't know my start time and I don't know my end time. So instead of integrating time with those endpoints, I do actually know my start angle and my end angle. So I can integrate with respect to theta, and if I want to learn how long it took, if I know dt d theta, then as I integrate with respect to theta, I can get the amount of time that it took to go around the 2 pi radians. Most of the time that we spend going around the circle is spent in this slow region, and the closer r is to the bifurcation, the more true that is. So we're just going to make the approximation that actually all of our time is spent in this slow region. Then the first thing I want to think about to think about how long it takes to get through that slow region is actually this other problem, this problem with a parabola. You can see that the shape of r minus cosine theta is similar to the shape of the parabola when we're near zero. And I'm going to note that for this parabola, when we're not close to the origin, we're moving super, super quickly. And so um, we're not actually spending very much time on that motion. Again, for the parabola, the approximation is really similar that most of our time is being spent trying to cross near the bifurcation when, when r is a value that's pretty close to bifurcation. And so instead of integrating from 0 to 2 pi, I'm just going to integrate actually over the entire line and learn how long it takes for a particle to traverse this entire line. And that's going to be um, related to how long it takes for uh, to traverse 2 pi in angle. So this entire line, I'm going from negative infinity to infinity. Now I'm moving in x instead of theta, so I'm going to use dt dx integrated with respect to x. And I actually know dt dx because dx dt is r plus x squared. dt dx is 1 over r plus x squared. So now I have an expression for how the time that it takes to traverse this line uh, depends 
depends on R. And I'd really like to know how it scales with R, how it changes with R as we get closer to the bifurcation. So I'm going to do, uh, I guess, basically a little bit of manipulation. First of all, I'm going to pull this R out from the equation. And so I get a 1 over R and a 1 plus x squared over R. So that was R over R gave me the 1. And this x squared over R, these things are completely equivalent. And now, OK, x squared over R is pretty suggestive of a u substitution. So I'm just going to do the u substitution that it suggests. I'm going to let u equal x over the square root of R. And that tells me that du is dx over the square root of r. So then dx is equal to the square root of r du. So I substitute in square root of r du, where there was a dx. Um, and I substitute in uh, u squared for x squared over r. OK, and so this is now uh, what the integral is equal to. 1 over r square root of r du over 1 plus u squared. And I'm going to pull out all the r stuff. OK, so we have 1 plus the square root of r times the integral from negative infinity to infinity of du over 1 plus u squared. I want to note that inside this integral, there are no r's. So this integral is just going to give us some number, some constant. It could be 7 or 5 or 13. I don't really care, because the thing I was interested in was how this stuff scaled with r. And that scaling with r has been pulled out of the integral, and it's a 1 over square root of r scaling. So it happens to be the case that this integral integrates to pi, and there's some trigonometric substitution that would allow you to see that. But what I really cared about was this 1 over square root of r scaling on the amount of time it takes um, to get through that bottleneck. So uh, uh, the differential equation we were considering was x dot equals r plus x squared, and we found that the time scales as 1 over the square root of r for um, r close to 0. Those are the values of r that we care about, and those are um, uh, the values of r where things really take a long time through the bottleneck. And so this is what that curve looks like. Here's r, and here's the amount of time it will take to get through the bottleneck. And uh, it uh, diverges as uh, we approach r equals 0, as you can see from the form of this equation. And so it's just going up like that. Um, and we expect that. It should go to infinity as r goes to 0, since at the exact point where r hits 0 in this formulation, um, there's going to be a fixed point, and we're going to get stuck at the fixed point instead of actually being able to traverse from negative infinity to infinity in x. And so, uh, OK, it'll take an infinite amount of time to get through, because we never actually get through. So in this way, we can see that um, we really can see our closeness to the bifurcation in how slowly, how slowly x is moving. Uh, the original thing we cared about was theta dot equals r minus cosine theta. And um, it's going to behave pretty similarly. Let's look at that. Um, so it has a parabolic shape near theta equals 0. And so I'm just going to do a little bit of a Taylor expansion right there, taking the first two terms. Uh, I think these are right. Um, and so what you can see is that I have a constant plus theta squared over 2. Well, that's basically constant plus x squared. These are really similar in form. Um, and so I expect time to go as 1 over the square root of r minus 1. Uh, there could be a factor of like 2 in there or something, but I don't care about constant factors. The thing I want to know about is the dependence on r. And you can see that we still have that square root dependence. So that means that uh, as we go uh, around uh, an oscillator and we're going through a slow period and a fast period, um, the total time that we take, we're assuming it's really determined by how much time it takes to get through this bottleneck. And this bottleneck, uh, the amount of time it takes to get through there is proportional to how close we are, uh, 1 over the square root of how close we are to the bifurcation.